Fergus Garrett, donc, qui est jardinier en chef du domaine de Great Dixter en Grande-Bretagne et qui travaille depuis des années sur les palettes végétales hybrides, c'est-à-dire qui associe à la fois des plantes domestiques et des plantes sauvages pour justement apporter de la vie et diversifier les palettes végétales dans les jardins. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real honor to be here in, in Paris again. I'm very sorry that I'm not speaking French next time I come. I make sure I will be speaking French to everybody. A thank you to Valor and, and to Verdier for, uh, you know, taking a big part in this, this extraordinary confer uh, conference. It's been very stimulating. Um, and I want to spe say special thanks to Michel de Bourne for, um, for hosting me and for Veronique as, as, as well. My talk is about the journey we have taken to discover the high levels of biodiversity in our garden. And what we have found is relevant to any garden, um, but it's also relevant to parks, to public spaces, And also, you don't need large gardens or to rewild to do, to do this. Small spaces can add up to a complex mosaic, which is good for biodiversity. You know, um, so I've put a lot of slides together. Some of them I will go through quite quickly, um, because this is not a talk about plants, but it's about the ecosystem within our garden, which is important. Um, and it shows how Garden plants, when they rub shoulders or when they are in bed with wild plants, can result in you know, great biodiversity and, and very good results. And we've been working with scientists over a number of years to actually get a very clear picture on this. Okay. So you can see that Great Dixter is quite a wildish garden. It has clipped hedges, but it also has wildflowers, And, and garden flowers next to each other. It's charming, it's romantic, we're open to the public, we are in the south of England, and we are about 2.4 hectares large, but the whole estate is 24 hectares. We get about 700 to 750 millimeters of rain a year. It's a historic garden, it's been there for over 100 years. And the plants are very comfortable within it. You know, the, um, the plants spill out onto the paths. There are lots of plants coming out of the walls. And the whole place is very atmospheric and very charming. Our seats look like this. And our walls look like this. And the same wall within five weeks does that. That's exactly the same wall. There's another wall. And it changes, you know, as the weeds go on. And this is a haven for all sorts of insects. So you can see it's a garden that's partly wild, but it's also a garden that's very ornamental, has lots of colorful plants in it. And it's also a garden that has structure with hedges and topiary. And it's also a place where the countryside comes into it. The informality is not liked by everybody, but the younger generations like it more and more. And one special thing about Dixter is it's got long grass meadows that come right into the garden. So they're almost like the vegetation that you see under orchards. They're full of grasses. They're full of all sorts of legumes. They're full of orchids and a whole range of plants that come over a long season. They're a very interesting tapestry of orchids and wildflowers, <coughs> and they rub shoulders with the highly managed parts of the garden, like the topiary pieces. And from these long grass areas, if you go to our walls, the walls are dripping with vegetation, with flowers. And as you go from the walls, 
to walk up to the building, to the terrace, your walk is like this. And then you end on a terrace that looks like this. And that same terrace, within two or three weeks, changes to that, as one lot of flowers finish and a lot of, another lot of flowers come. The edges of our walkways look like this, and even our nursery beds, where we grow the mother plants for our nursery, look like that. And then within five, six weeks, that same area in the summer looks like that. So you can see there's a lot of change within that garden. It's very dynamic. There is very little um, bare soil. You know, the vegetation completely covers it. And it goes, the season goes from snowdrops now, the winter season, right the way through to the autumn, there are flowers within it. So you can see one area, this again is a nursery stock bed where we grow the mother plants for the nursery. It's got alliums in it, and that same place in July looks like that. Some of these areas have two, th three, four, five, six, seven layers in them. And they are permanent layers that come one after another. For instance, it could be a snowdrop, a galanthus with a crocus, amongst prunus tenella. The galanthus and the crocus flower first, the prunus tenella takes over. When the prunus tenella finishes flowering, Centuria montana takes over. And they have been living together like this for 30 years that I've been there. Nothing is planted in, nothing is moved out. It's the same, one plant follows another. And we grow all sorts of plants together in the mixed border, mixed border style. So this area, which has got galanthus in the winter, looks like this in the summer, where we have bulbs, annuals, shrubs, herbaceous plants, you know, plants vivace, all of them in together. And this makes for diversity, but it also makes for a very long season, which is very important for all the pollinators and for all the feeders. So if you take our mixed border, when you visit it now, it's full of hellebores and galanthus. By the time the summer comes, it looks like this. And this is in June, this is in July, this is October. <coughs> And then from October, you go into November, and then by December comes, it goes brown. But we don't cut all this brown down, we leave it up, and we only cut little bits as we work through the border. And that system of a long season, one plant coming and going, mimics this system of what happens in our meadows. So crocuses first, there are many other plants, but Fritillaria next, and then orchids follow. So it's a, it's, a, it's a garden that is wildish, but it has a long season. But it's also a garden full of color and full of joy, you know, full of plants that we grow over a, lo over, um, a long season and plant them in. So we, we may have a display like this, or a display like that, or a display with tulips amongst digitalis. The tulips flower first, the digitalis come later. And then the same area may do this in the summer. And in the following year, this may happen, followed by that, and then followed by that. So it's, this, is, this is our carrot that invites the public in to this, to this wild space, which is very important. And it changes from one year to another. So there's another bed in the spring. This is the same area in midsummer, and this is the same area in late summer. From one year to another, this battery is going on, the, on your computer. Um, 
Veronique, the battery is going on your computer, it says. <laughs> okay, I've got it now. Yeah. Okay, so while Veronique's looking at that, I'll start again. So if you look at the whole 2.4 hectares, I would say about one hectare is wild. About one hectare has um, the mixed border with plant vivace and arbuste and trees. And about 0.4 hectare has this sort of vegetation that we change twice or three times a year. So it's a complete mix of all of those, all of those things together. The estate around us has areas pasture where, where animals graze. It has meadow areas for cutting hay. It also has trees and woodland areas that we cut on a regular, regular way, coppicing to extract the wood. It grows again, we cut it and extract it, so it has a very nice mosaic system. Okay, there we go, bravo, thanks very much, thank you. Um, so look, that may change to that, which changes to that. That's in the 0.4 hectares. But in, overall, all of this is mixed in together in our borders. So if you look at this colourful border, this will change as it goes into the summer. As the plants grow, the tulips finish, there are galanthus and hellebores there first, then the narcissus come, the tulips finish, the plant vivas grow over the top, and then it fills in for the summer. So you'll see that there. This border looks like this in May, then it looks like this in July, then it looks like this in October. Very long season. We also have a tropical garden that has vegetation like this, um, that makes a picture like that. When you look up at the sky, you don't see the sky. Just outside the, the tropical garden, our meadow looks like this, with iris, iris angus, angustifolia. And the general picture like this, it's very charming, it's very romantic, but you can see it's a complete mix of a garden. So it's a highly but sensitively managed flower garden open to the public. We are colourful, dynamic, dramatic. We're full of non-native plants with native plants and we're gardened. So gardens like us, whether they're large or small, have sometimes been labelled as unnatural and all things bad associated with old-fashioned gardening. So everyone, when we started to do the investigation on insect, insects, everyone expected the wildlife value at Great Dixter to be low because it was garden like this. And they expected the countryside around us to be much richer. But we were seeing, you know, all of these sort of animals and insects. And so we were enjoying the butterflies, we were enjoying the moths, we were enjoying the snakes and the spiders. So I thought it was rich, but I also expected the countryside to be richer. Now the great gardener who gardened here, Christopher Lloyd, who was my professor, my mentor, died in 2006. When he dies in 2006, I wanted to take things further. I stopped spraying because he liked using chemicals. I used organic fertilizer instead of inorganic fertilizer, but reduced the amount we used. We used a lot more organic matter. We stopped using peat. We watered less and developed more sealed units, which are those areas of multi-layered planting that one comes after another and we use less annuals and bedding, but we still bed it out with annuals. And then I allowed the outside edges, not the garden itself, but the outside edges of the garden, for the wild vegetation to billow out and to grow out more. And the place became more charming and more atmospheric 
But quite lots of people in 2007 questioned what I was doing. They say, no, oh, the place is getting wild because the outside looks, looks like this, you know, it looks very wild, and our car parks look like that, you know, which was very atmospheric, but not so good for the cars, you know, when they came. And in the garden, I started using wild plants, what people considered to be weeds amongst our planting. So this is Anthriscus sylvestris, and it was just very, very charming. You know, last year, last year, I took this photograph on my phone one evening. It was like, it's like stepping into paradise, and you know all the color is gonna come through all of this later on. So the two can live happily together. While I was doing all of this, my wife, who is an ecologist, entomologist, zoologist, um, said to me, you ought to get a proper audit done so that you know what's there and how you, so you can manage the land outside the garden and in the garden accordingly. So I completely ignored her and thought, and, and then started playing around. I created more meadows. Um, and I introduced honeybees, thinking that they were really great as pollinators, not knowing that they could actually be quite bad for the local pollinators that are there, because they are not native very often. They're aggressive. They squeeze other pollinators out. They disrupt the flower as, as well. So I just ignored that and got some honeybees in, got the village and the children to make meadows. And every time I'd come home and say, oh, we've done another meadow, she'd say, get an audit done. Why do you need another meadow? You may not need meadow, you may need scrub or woodland or short grass or bare grass. Find out what you, um, what you need. So she'd say, get a proper audit done. So again, I completely ignored her. And, and then we started doing some work in our woodlands with butterfly conservation, cutting more of our woodland. I then gave work to the community, whether we were producing charcoal, we were producing benches, we were producing hurdles, stakes, all from our local thing, because we are very much into supporting a community, because we could easily become a very rich place, but actually we're rich in our hearts because we support a community of a very diverse range of people there. So this was very good. And our woodlands look like this in the spring. And then we would cut it and have this. This is another lecture, actually. You know, we would create this mosaic system, a mosaic system in our woods. And the butterfly conservation said, fantastic, really great mosaic system, very successful. So then I thought, if we create a mosaic system in our woods and it increases biodiversity, why don't I create a mosaic system in our grassland? Why don't I do that? But all of this, you know, was very ad hoc because we didn't have idea why we were doing it. We didn't have an idea why we were doing this. Different cutting regimes to get different flowers. And my wife would say, get an audit done. I'd ignore her and I, just to make her happy, I bought her some sheep, I bought a moth trap, and then we started capturing moths like this, very colorful, very interesting. And she'd say, that's all very well, but get an audit done. You need the information. As a scientist, we need the information. So I set up a biodiversity committee, and my wife was one of, one of the team of two, and then we started to make investigations into bumblebees and looked at swifts and all of those sort of things. And then I wrote to the British Arachnological Society to come and visit Dixter. But they did not want to come. They didn't want to come because it was a garden. They were more interested in the wild, in the, in the nature reserves around us, rather than coming into the garden. So I said to them, if you come and have your meeting, I'll feed you, I'll give you as much drink as you want. You don't have to survey the garden. Because they're interesting, you know, these people are very interesting. So they came, there's about 25 of them had their meeting. At lunchtime, they said, oh, we want to get air, so can we go out into the garden? They went out into the garden, and within one hour, they found 77 different spiders in the garden. And as they entered the front gate, they found the spider, under that metal 
clasp there that's only been seen three times in the United Kingdom. They walked down that path, they found a spider under a stone that had only been recorded five times since 1920. So they were really excited. And before I knew it, we were on the front page of the British Arachnological um, magazine and with seven pages of all the spiders they found. And then they said, we found some interesting spiders, but we also found some really interesting beetles. So don't burn your firewood. So with that in mind, with that in mind, I started building these habitat piles. You know, these big piles for detritivores. I didn't even know what a detritivore was. And interestingly, we put a very, um, a very special microphone in there to record, the, to record the, all the noises coming from this heap. And it, it's as busy as Paris and, and, and London, these. It's just full of all sorts of life and a succession of life, not just detritivores, things that come and eat the detritivores, things that are different on the south side, the sunny side, things that are different on the north side. So very, very inter interesting this. So I'd say I'd build one of these, and then the woodpeckers would come and the swallows would come. I'd go home and I'd say to my wife, the woodpeckers are here, the swallows are here, and she'd say, get an audit done, you know, <laughs> because you just don't know why you're doing all of this. You know, if you're going to stand up in front of a, a bunch of ecologists, you want to be able to say to them, these are the facts. Because there is this thing called the web of life, and rightly so, it starts with the soil. So we're doing lots of investigations in, into the microbiology of our soil, right the way through from the bacteria to the fungi to the protozoa, all of those, those things. But again, that's another lecture. Um, so I got a whole bunch of experts in to come and study the garden. But I also wanted them to study the land outside to show how important the land outside was. So it was out, they studied for a, for a year, some of them only came five times, some of them came three times, some of them came 14 times, but not very often. So it was only a very brief study. In that brief study, they recorded over 2,400 species of, and I'll just switch on to that so you can see that. So they recorded over 2,400 species from a handful of, handful of visits. And these were species that were native species, not the garden flowers and all of that. These were just things that were native, native insects, native plants. There were over 110 species of lichen. There were over 110 species of bee out of the total of 230 in the UK. I know France has got, I think, over 1,000. But um, now the number has gone up to 137 species of bee out of a 230. There were 16 species of bumblebee out of 24. The number has gone up to 17. There were over 400 species of moth. There were 32 species of butterfly out of 59 to total species in the UK and over 250 species of spider. And don't get me wrong, this is, isn't about numbers. Because just because some, some place has got 2,000 spe species and other place has got 1,000 species, that doesn't mean that place is more important than that. But this was a point of proving that the place was biodiverse. And they said... that the numbers will go up as we survey more, obviously. They said rare species were common, were easily found, which means that they are common. They're not so rare. Our lead ecologist, Andy Phillips, says, he was our lead entomologist, said he was, this was one of the richest sites he surveyed in his 30 years of surveying. And he also said that he was on the spider, the spider board, the arachnological board, and when my letter came in for them to come into the garden, he was the first person to put his hand up to say, let's not go to a garden because it will be sterile, okay? So it completely changed the way he, he, um, he thinks. He calls us a garden nature reserve and thinks we should be designated a local nature reserve or a local wildlife site. 
And this was unexpected within the ecological com community. It was slightly unexpected amongst us as well. But there is, in the United Kingdom especially, there's a prejudice against traditional gardens like ours, saying that they're garden, they're touched by the hands of humans, so they're low in biodiversity. So why is Dixter rich? Okay, why is it rich? Um, let's go there. Well, there's a wide range of ha habitats, from wet, dry, sunny, shady, mosaic woodland to mosaic grassland to bare ground. We're detritus rich. We have porous buildings. We have lots of old fence bows, recycled material. We have porous walls and so on. It's a complex and diverse mosaic. There's a variety of habitats there. There's a long season of pollen and nectar, layered planting over a long season, maybe seven layers. So exactly that was said in the last talk, it enhances the season because the, short, the season of British native plants is relatively short. And, it, and as, the, as the winters get milder, it really stretches out that season. We haven't sprayed for the last 14 years. Well, it's actually for the last 17 years. So that amount of care is important. There's trauma and disturbance from digging, which creates another habitat. So there's a diversity of practices. Um, the types of pl plants are interesting. There's lots of Asteraceae, lots of Alliums, and lots of Apiaceae. So they're good for pollinators, as well as there's great diversity there. The web also feeds itself. The more there is, the more there will be. And also that element of creativity, what Dr. Nigel Dunnett calls creative ecology is important. And also it's an old garden as well. So. See if I got that. Yeah. So a, a garden with ecological practices, such as Dixter, can be a haven for wildlife. Dixter proves this. But small gardens can do this as well. They can be significant. Um, so can urban spaces, rooftops, parks, pavements, cracks, wall. Every space can play a part in this. And you can and wildlife will adapt to it. And you don't need to rewild in order to do this. And it's for us, it's about blurring the edges between horticultural and ecology whilst creating beautiful artistic spaces. And, and at the same time, embracing wild plants and seeing them in another light. Okay. So, also interesting. Okay. Ecologists were very interesting. They said, what you are in the garden is that your woodland edge, which is an extremely rich zone that's been tidied up and lost in the United Kingdom. You know, with enhanced diversity, um, diversity of flora, enhanced diversity of structures and habitats, and enhanced diversity of activities, you have something that's the perfect storm. And there is no reason why this can't be replicated in towns and cities. And as we know, in order to make this happen, you need to be brave, bold, diverse, dynamic. And really, the power needs to go to the visionaries in order to make this. In fact, we have to all work together. And the great thing about this, about Dexter doing this and highlighting this, is that we capture a wide audience. So it means that we can make things happen. OK, so also interesting that Dexter mimics soft cliff habitat. And, and it was very interesting looking at the garden through the ecologist's eyes like this. Because you, they said you're woodland edge, but you're also soft cliff. You know, because you've got the same species from both of those areas. Where you've got bare, porous path adjacent to vegetation that's constantly reworked, and it's an extremely valuable and dynamic habitat that greatly enhances your biodiversity. So those bedding areas, the 0.4 hectares, was very important. They said, you look just like this. And if you think about it, you know, there are over 430 thousand hectares of garden in the UK. There are 240 thousand hectares of roadside verge in the UK. There's 1.7 million hectares of urban area. And all of these are out of the food production zone. And all of this within our control. So, you know, that, mo that mosaic system that happens at Dixter, that can be replicated in a town and city. It can be re re replicated in a lot of these areas. 
And to understand this, this further, because I'm only giving you the tip of the iceberg here, um, we produced a biodiversity heat map. So we looked at the borders as one thing, we looked at the meadows as another thing, we looked at the woodlands as another thing, we looked at different fields as another thing. And we expected the woodlands to be really rich, the meadow areas with all those orchids to be really, really rich. We expected the, the pasture land to be really rich, and they were all rich. But the richest part of the, the whole place was this garden here. They had more species than, than anywhere else. And then we looked at, you know, the sort of species there are and where they are, you know, and you can see that what these, with these figures that the formal garden for, for um, things like diptera, lepidoptera, all those things, the formal garden had the highest numbers. And this is only part way through the, through the study, so the numbers are low there, but the formal garden was really, really quite interesting, and it was interesting for rare species as, as well, and it was interesting for nectar and pollen habitats as, as well. So if you look at that, all of those different habitats, the formal garden was, was, was rich. And then if you just look at our insects, if you look at the insects there, the estate is the whole area that is the 24 hectares. The formal garden is the 2.4 hectares. Well, if you take the meadows out of it, it's, it's about 1.6 hectares. And if you look at the numbers of insects in that 1.6 hectares, it was far higher than anywhere else. Far higher than those meadows, far higher than those woodlands, far higher than, than those sort of... Um, the farm from the sort of the paddocks and the new bee meadow and so on. And then, you know, I won't talk about this, but it was really interesting, the sort of plants that, that things were on, and we sort of scaled it down to things that were food plants, that things that they used for shelter and hunting, things that they used for, for nectar, and, you know, things that they used for patrolling and so on and so on. But it was interesting, wasn't it? Because we thought this would be really quite rich. But in fact, this area, without a single orchid, was as rich as that. And the barn garden with that pond that I showed you was twice as rich as these, these areas. And our success is down to having wild plants with, with garden plants. Our success is having, down to having this richness and this diversity. Our success is down to not cutting everything down straight away and tidying everything up. <coughs> Our success is down to having certain types of flowers that are very good landing pads and that, that encourage a wide range of, of insects, things like APAC, things like alliums, but also having that extreme diversity. Our success is down to having that long season, jam-packed, absolutely packed full of plants. Our success is down to having that, those variety of habitats, from woodland to woodland edge to long grass to short grass, which is also important, to those colourful borders, to a building that attracts insects, that has cracks in it, and all of those things, so that these things have got a home. Our success is down to having all of those porous structures, all those old buildings where things can nest in the building and then they come out immediately and their food's right there on their doorstep. And that's not just the walls, that's on the surfaces, the flat surfaces as well, where things can drill into. It's, it's also in the buildings and also in the materials that we, that we have around the place. We don't take away the old material, we keep it until it rots. We let trees that are dying die as long as they are safe. We have lots of detritus as we protect things over the winter. And we are creative in the way that we provide insect hotels. We, we make stress meadows so that we can have very stressed grass, which is open textures for the bees to come into. We close off the drainage in some areas to make them flood and so on, mimicking what beavers do, as well as that, there is this sort of activity. The meadows are cut, then the crocuses come, the fritillarias come, the gladioli and the anthriscus come, then the, the, um, the filipendula come, and then it goes brown like this, 
we cut it again. And then some areas we cut regularly so that we have white clover instead of red clover for a different set of insects. And then we allow certain areas of paloos, of lawn, to develop into this sort of vegetation. And this area, which was a lawn, 15 years later, did that with the orchids that are in there. And the whole area is romantic and charming, but very sympathetic towards gardeners. It's rich in color. It's rich in activity. It's a good training place for gardeners. It has excitement in it, but really quite importantly for us as a gardener, it shares it with all of these things. So you feel happy in that space because you're sharing that space with things that were there many years before you were there. Okay? And what the ecologist said is that the interesting thing about the garden is that because it's so richer than the surrounding countryside around it, it's got remnants of things that would have been in the countryside 400 years ago, still in that oasis of a garden. So ecologists in the UK have considered gardens and design landscapes to be a part of the problem, but are now realizing that we can be part of the solution. Gardens, large or small, in the countryside, urban and suburban, whether they are public or private, along with roadside verges, urban areas, brownfield sites, and so on, together will add up to something very effective. And this, along with protecting the countryside and farming in a sensitive way, will make a huge difference, not just for biodiversity, but for mitigating climate change as well. So it's great that Laura Gatti is doing what she's doing at the top. It's great that they're rewilding at NEC. It's great that John Little does this in city areas. But it's also important to recognize that gardens can play a part in this as well. And all together, they can come into these spaces. And that's why we're working with certain towns around us to, to take them, as Sheffield has done under Zach Tudor and Nigel Dunnett, to take them from gray to green like that. So as a garden, we're involved in this. And wouldn't it be lovely if our towns had walls like this, or maybe occasional seats like that? But the really important thing is knowledge is key so we can act in the right way. And that's why, as part of our team at Dixter, we have a resident ecologist, entomologist, that comes in regularly to feed, to feed our brains so we can be creative and we can act accordingly. And it's wonderful that then you then make sure that that side of the, a gardener's brain is open as they go through, and it goes from one generation to another. So what makes Dexter rich is relevant to any design landscape or any garden. The mosaic system within Dexter can be replicated in any village, town, or city. But it just needs politicians, ecologists, town planners, councils, builders, landscapers, architects, landscape architects, volunteer groups, gardeners, and private individuals to have the will to work together. It's about bringing wildlife in at every opportunity, and gardens and gardeners can play their part. Everyone will bring a different element to it, which will create the, the most diverse mosaic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you about that. Merci, Fergus, pour cette, cette ode à la tolérance, à la diversité. Et je pense que nous allons continuer. Avez-vous des questions ou il y aurait trop de choses peut-être à demander Alors, y a-t-il une question My wife was right. <laughs> Bon, 
ben, s'il n'y euh, a pas de questions, je vous encourage à discuter pendant la pause euh, avec Fergus. Et avant la pause, euh, ben, vous devrez me subir encore un petit peu. Curious about investigating the way we go to the into the future. It's not just about biodiversity. It's about sustainability. It's about building a community as well. And I think the important thing. I'm the I'm the CEO of that organisation. The important thing is to create something where you're open to discussion all the time. With because the team I've got are so fantastic. They're saying they're pulling me into the di direction of looking at soil biology, for instance, and how we can. They're looking at. We're looking at studies on mollusks and snails and so on. We're looking at. We're looking at interesting new flowers. We can. We can. We're looking at schools. We can work with towns and communities. We can work with, and it's really wonderful to be in a place where you can actually interact like that. Still go forward as a garden that's open to the public, that's beautiful, but actually have tentacles out that do interesting things. Merci bien.